Hey. All right. Well, I'm, apologies for the um, Zoom issues. And um, I think there was a, an issue getting it. We sent the wrong one out to the uh, for the public announcement. So um, but I guess if there's anyone here um, who would like uh, to provide um, public comment, I'll open it up for that. Um, Okay, I'm not seeing anyone. Um, so I'll, I'll get started. Um, I wanted to, to kick things off. Um, so uh, today you'll be hearing from John Hawksworth on the reforestation study. Um, and then Rebecca McCown will be presenting on the road rule and steep slopes um, rule selection process. Um, so just to, to recap the, the reforestation study, um, so we had a, we initiated a, a pilot study back in uh, 2021. Um, after that, we completed a report on the pilot study that that John um, drafted. Uh, following that, we worked with Mount Hood Environmental to develop the reforestation study, and um, staff collected data from 2023 to 2024. Um, after that, we handed the data off to MHE. MHE uh, completed the analysis and uh, final report. Um, we did provide this committee an opportunity to um, provide feedback this past summer. And so um, thank you to, to the committee for providing uh, the feedback on that report. Um, so today you'll be hearing from John on the details around the study. We haven't presented results from that study. So uh, today we'll be doing that. Um, so that final report will be publicly available soon. Uh, we're currently working on getting that report uh, uploaded to the ODF website. And um, once we get that uploaded, we'll, we'll send you the link. Um, so next steps. Um, so that was a, a big milestone, um, but you know there's still a little bit more work to do. As as you know, part of our process is um, following our reports is uh, making sure the um, message gets out right. And so um, we do have some work, some outreach work internally and externally as well, and that's something we're starting uh, discussions. Um, internally and uh, we'll be working with our, our training unit to um, develop a, a communication plan around this. Um, so as you'll see from John, there are, are areas of improvement. Um, and um, so, you know, those are um, plus the, um, you know, the, the summary of the results, I think is worth sharing. Um, so we will um, keep you updated on that. Um, so for the road rule and steep slopes rule selection, I uh, I, I sent a document ahead of the meeting um, just on the road rules uh, selection. Uh, I wanted to give you an opportunity to take a peek at that before we um, present it on, on that. Um, and uh, we will also, so I'll be sending the steep slopes rule selection document soon after this meeting as well. I just wanted to, um, I didn't want to overload you with, with documents to review. The one that I sent was a pretty lengthy and thorough document. Um, but um, I wanted Rebecca to present some details around the steep slope rules before I sent that. So that will be coming your way soon. Uh, looking forward to uh, getting your feedback on, on those documents. Um, just some general updates uh, around monitoring. Um, I did set up the committee meetings for 2025. The, the next meeting is January 30th, 2025. Um, so at that meeting, Mark Rose at Mount Hood Environmental will be presenting an update on the study design um, for road and steep slope rules. Um, another update, uh, Emily Martin, um, some of you may know her through the Adaptive Management Program Committee. Uh, she was serving a developmental role as, as a coordinator there. Um, 
she will be returning to the monitoring unit in January um, after her leave. So you'll be um, seeing her um, starting next year. Um, also, I just want to thank the committee for um, your regular attendance and engaging in discussions at, at these meetings. And, um, you know, you've, you've been really helpful in, in helping us to develop the uh, new compliance monitoring program and uh, your feedback on reports is, is much appreciated. So just want to take a minute to thank the committee and also want to thank um, monitoring staff for their hard work in uh, completing the reforestation study. Um, we, uh, the, there, was, there was a lot of work, a lot of sites, and um, the weather wasn't always the best and the terrain was, was rough at times. So I just really wanna thank um, my staff for, for all their hard work and in, in getting that completed. So um, those were the updates that I had. Um, Rebecca, are we, is John signed in yet? No, nope. we'll, uh, if you want to get started on, on the road rules and steep slopes, um, rule okay. selection. Okay. Um, I just did get a message saying he thought it started at 10. So he, he may be joining us. Do you, do you want me to wait till he joins? I would, I would go ahead. Okay. Let me pull up my presentation. Can everyone see this? Yes. Can you guys see the presentation? Thanks, Rebecca. Okay. We can see it. Okay, yes. great. Okay, thank you. Um, so greetings, as you may know, my name is Rebecca McCown, and I am the Repairing and Aquatic Specialist in the Monitoring Unit of ODF Forest Resource Division. I'll be going over the rule selection documents for the roads and steep slopes. Everyone should have received the road rule selection document on September 30th for review. This is for the Rule Division 629-625. As noted at our July 2024 um, CMPC meeting, we had multiple reviewers comb through each rule posed as a question in this division. Each reviewer documented their input on suitability for inclusion. So we had the field support coordinators, uh, Stacy Savona and Tim Moss. We had the road specialist, Greg Erb, FRIA specialist, Arden Gwynn, monitoring staff, John Hawksworth, Paul Clemens, myself, and several others. And now we are pending your input. Um, uh, just like the riparian rule selection process, when evaluating each rule for study inclusion, we ask, is this rule measurable? Is it possible to determine compliance a year after the activity is completed? Was the rule assessed by ODF in the past? And is this rule um, activity included in other state um, forest compliance studies? Or just to see in terms of the uh, how they rank the importance. Okay, there. If you recall in the riparian rule selection document, we had color coded the rules. Blue, ODF staff considered it for inclusion into the pilot study. Yellow, there are some nuances that required further input discussion. Red, we did not consider it for inclusion. And after going over the 20 pages of rules for the, the roads, um, we have come up with the following, and these are kind of rough numbers, but we had 56 blue, 83 yellow that needed further dis, um, consideration, discussion, and red uh, do not include. And again, to note this, this was just for the pilot study. So as we uh, evolve into the long-term study, those numbers will change. So I do want to note it's a very large document, and I appreciate you guys even opening it. Um, it's a similar process as before with riparian rules document. Instructions included at the beginning of the document. Specials have provided some really good details and context. So focus on, the, I, this is my recommendation, is to focus on the rules in blue and highlight it in yellow. If you have time to go through the rules in red, I encourage it. Um, if you find a rule we have categorized as red and you think it should be included, please let us know, um, document why you think it should be included um, in the pilot study or future studies. 
We are requesting the CMPC members to note whether they agree or disagree with how it is categorized and note why. If you'd rather just note the ones that you disagree with, that, that is fine as well. Then submit feedback to ODF monitoring unit email, um, which we'll have at the end of this, this presentation by November 7th. So again, considerations to think of when you're reviewing these rules um, uh, for either the pilot or the long-term study are, we have some reoccurring themes you will um, find. One is timing. Dif is it difficult to determine if it's compliance a year to a year and a half after the fact? Uh, need to see, it, is it a rule that we would need to see during or just after the activity occurred? So that was one of the main, some of the main uh, buckets that we were finding that, it, you know, a year and a half would be difficult to determine compliance. The other one is, is, is it difficult to query? For example, if a rule requirement is at a discretion of a forester, did the forester require it, ask for it to be submitted, such as a uh, written plan, how would we query and to determine who was required to and who was not? Um, for example, 629-625-010092A is one of, an example of that. So is it queryable? Um, the other one is vague terms. I'll, you will note that there's many rules that use the words such as minimize, maximize, avoid, limit, sufficient. We would need to have these terms defined before we could consistently measure rule compliance across the state. So these could be future long-term study qualitative um, rules that we assess, or we could put a metric on, on terminology. Then we also have the yellow ones, which discussion needed. Some rules are very technical and require experience. Training may be required of all surveyors to understand the engineering aspects of measuring compliant, especially with the road engineering. So now I'm going to go over the steep slope selection process and um, uh, I will go slow, and if you guys have any questions, please let me know. Uh, this is a kind of a review of, of this, this our last meeting in July. Again, as noted in our July CMPC meeting, we have two rules sections that fall under existing rules, pre-private forest accord, and that's 629-630-0150, ground-based harvesting on steep slopes or erosion-prone slopes. We also have 629-630-0500, harvesting on high landslide hazard locations. Then we have our new rules, um, post uh, private forest accord, and those are the Western Oregon harvest slopes model rules. And then we also have the stream adjacent failures. I do wanna note um, with regards to stream adjacent failure rules, since these areas are not mapped um, and are not queryable, compliance assessment um, uh, would be difficult unless we assessed it along with like when we're doing the riparian rules. So possibly adding a data sheet to riparian rule compliance monitoring in the long-term study, um, though it is, it is likely we would end up with a sample size insufficient for statistical analysis, the qualitative information gathered would still be valuable. So again, that, that rule might be better fit when we are assessing riparian areas. Okay, um, the next one, steep slope rules selection process. Um, again, Adam noted this, after today's meeting, we'll be sending out three steep slope rule selection documents. One for you guys to review and provide feedback, and this will have both the existing and new rules. Um, and then we also will have two documents that are reference documents that I encourage you to uh, kind of help orientate yourself with the steep slopes modeled rules. Again, we are requesting you review the, the rules in blue and highlighted in yellow. Um, and please note if you disagree or agree. And I do have to thank Camille Collette, our um, FPO Geotech with providing those two additional reference documents. Um, there, It's really key to kind of understand um, that process. And, and why I say um, for the steep slope model rules, they're actually, and, and, this, and I'm gonna get into this, they actually all, should be considered for um, for inclusion into the, but it would be kind of a, because landowners have a decision, they can make um, decisions in terms of uh, the process. It would be up to the compliance monitoring survey crew to identify which decision did they make and it did align with um, FPA rules. Okay, so before I go into the steep slopes model rule compliance, um, 
I wanted to go over some uh, terminology. One, also I wanted to note that I highly recommend taking the Certified Steep Slopes training online. We will send you a link. It does require you to set up an account and work day. Um, but the key terminology that is important to know when looking at these rules are um, the DDTA, which is Designated Debris Flow Traversal Area, Designated Sediment Source Areas, which is DSSA, Trigger Sources, and Slope Retention Areas. Now, the long terms can kind of throw you, but once you um, get these four down, you should be good to go. And then the other point is to focus, the key point in terms of the, this, these next few slides is determining the decision points. Um, where do landowners and operators have options? Do they follow the prioritization process outlined in rule? And have the exceptions been made and justification provided? We'll go, go into that more now. So the designated debris flow traversal areas um, are designated along certain type end streams. Leave trees are required along the type end streams and the length of the designated debris flow traversal area. Trees are to be retained for 25 feet on either side of the active channel or center of the draw, if not present, where traversal areas are identified. The designated sediment source areas, hold on one sec. Uh, so these slope model, the slope model identifies areas most likely to experience landslides that initiate debris flow that will likely deliver fish to, to fish streams. The slope model also identifies areas or trigger sources that are most likely to trigger a high volume debris flow. Areas with trigger sources are displayed in the e-notification system or ferns um, and are to be prioritized over uh, areas without trigger sources. Two key items to note on these designated areas are yarding corridors may be cut with trees remaining on the ground through a designated sediment source area without a trigger source. And then no yarding corridors are to be cut through designated sediment source areas with trigger sources. So those are two items that the surveyors will be looking at when they're out in the field. So model output, designated sediment source areas are areas that the model identifies as most likely to trigger a high volume debris flow. These areas have the top 20% likelihood of triggering the top 33% high volume debris flow. High volume is important because high volume is correlated with high kinetic energy and therefore high volume debris flows are more likely to have enough energy to overcome friction long enough to reach type F streams. The slopes model also identify areas with trigger sources that are most likely to trigger a high volume debris flow. Areas with trigger sources are displayed in the e-notification system as such and are to be prioritized over the um, areas without trigger sources. So when the operator or landowner are making their decisions of choosing their areas, they need to prioritize red over blue. Okay, so slope retention areas apply to just Western Oregon. The slope retention areas are to represent a minimum of 50% of the designated source sediment source areas that are chosen. Slope retention areas are field identified and prioritized areas. And so this is where the surveyors will, um, compliance surveyors will be looking. Forest land that is man managed under the small forest land or owner minimum option are not required to follow the slopes retention areas. And what we'll be looking for is leave trees. Leave trees are required in the field identified slope retention areas, which are subset of the mapped designated sediment source areas. Forest practice technical guidance provides detail for field identific identification and for written plans. Knowing these definitions is critical critical to assessing rural compliance. Landowners Landowners and operators will be making decisions and we need to determine if those actions take and align with the FPA rules. So the um, overview, landowners, operators have decisions to make, standard selection process. They have to have uh, greater than or equal to 50% of the DSSAs need to be SRAs. They need to prioritize the red trigger source areas over the blue. And they have to prioritize um, the polygons that are large over the small. Um, and they need to have a clear explanation for reasons for non-standard selection, AKA exceptions. 
Some exceptions may include um, safety and or ecological reasons. An exception example, uh, standard cases, um, or standard causes more resource impact than non-standard. Uh, an example might be choosing SRAs via the standard selection process would require a significant amount of additional road building or landing construction across high landslide hazard locations in order to avoid yarding through a red SRA then might warrant a non-standard selection process for choosing other SRAs to retain trees in. So again, if there's a greater resource impact, there, there are exceptions. So when landowner operator does have the exception, they need to take time to describe in sufficient detail why it's better to, um, the option they're choosing is better than the standard selection process. Another example of um, eligible adjustments that the survey crew are going to have to uh, determine, you know, before going out in the field and then when going out in the field, is that the SRA boundaries may be adjusted for operational purposes that might be made uh, before going out in the field. A lot of modeled DSSAs or SRAs, which are the polygons, have these long skinny tails that might make things difficult for working around when it comes to time of harvest. So after selecting the SRAs, the landowner operators are allowed to adjust the boundaries slightly to make them easier to work with. They just need to retain the main body of the polygon and the total acreage that the original DSSA covered. This needs to be reflected in the written plan. Rules do not require it, but if additional vulnerable areas are found, the polygon may be expanded to include those areas. So, in preparation for survey, um, the, uh, again, okay, so before I go into this, um, one of the documents we will be sending you later today is labeled Modeled SSA Assessment Process Considerations. And again, Camille Collette, the geotech, uh, produced this, and I highly recommend you uh, reference it. This document provides details on what the compliance monitoring surveyors need to do to prepare for site visits. Uh, if the preparation for survey work, staff contract will need to review the written plans and detailed uh, both the modeled areas and field identified areas. So if the um, operator or landowner has have made adjustments and is, is it reflected in the written plan, they need to review stewardship forester comments, documented inferns, and other information inferns um, related to resource concerns. They also need to create a LIDAR map and a map of the site. Again, this is to get orientated before they go out in the field. And then also the steep slopes model map. Now, surveyors need to get a good understanding of the site and an idea of what to expect. Hey, Rebecca. Just yeah? sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, there was, uh, Casey's got his hand up. He's got a question. Oh. And uh, Francis also had a question in the chat. If, if you've got a yeah, minute, yeah. you could address those. Thanks. Okay. So thank you. I just, I couldn't see those. Okay. So Francis, um, who plans the roads for these sites? Does it require an engineer? Um, now, I'm as far as I know, it may you know depending on a, the the budget, they may have an engineer design the roads. Um, they may have assistance from ODF foresters. Um, I'm going to actually default to to Megan and Seth. In your scenarios, do you have engineers design your roads? Yeah, so there's <clears throat> there's a combination of things, right? Uh, depending on the landowner. Um, you don't, you ab you absolutely don't have to have engineers design your roads. I mean, imagine a small Ma and Pa who own 10 acres. They don't, they're not going to have to hire an engineer to, to build a road to the back of their property. Um, but, uh, it's certainly companies, bigger companies employ, uh, engineers that said there's, uh, there, there's also some, some discrepancy around or some, some issues with engineers, force engineers, and force road specialists, um, and whether somebody is licensed as an engineer or not. And certain projects uh, require the, you know, uh, an engineer stamp, uh, certainly, you know, bridge designs and things like that to some extent. But um, so the, the long answer to your question is, or the short answer to your question is no, they don't require engineers. Uh, the longer answer is, um, 
a lot of companies do have engineers and or road specialists that are very trained in this, but yeah. So I don't know if I answered your question. I don't know if Megan has anything to add. You, thank, thank you, Seth. You did, because as we can see, there's a whole diversity of types of roads and some of them are more or less challenging than the operator and the, yeah. the site is different. So I've just, it's clear that, but there's no requirement that, and you answered the question. Thank you. Yeah. So there is one thing that I would add here that I think is in important to point out because we're talking about steep slopes now and everyone that is laying out a unit with these steep slope set asides in them is certified by ODF. So you cannot participate in uh, or you cannot submit a FERNS notification without um, having your layout done by someone who's gone through the steep slope certification process. Which, which is that online link, there's a course or something. Yes. Yeah. Originally they held them in person. Um, and I, so I'm just thrilled that ODF did an online option because as people are hired or promoted into positions, it's very useful to have that class available for anyone to take anytime. Great. Yeah. Thank you for the background info. Yeah. Thank you, Seth and Megan. Sorry for putting you on the spot there. Um, but yes, I will be sending you that link and it's a really good um, training, the certification training. Um, and I uh, highly recommend taking, you know, taking that because it will help make sense uh, of everything I'm talking about. There's a lot of acronyms. So with uh, Casey Kula, you said the, the PFA Steep Slopes Map Viewer for those who don't have the link. Okay, you sent that. Thank you. Um, and then the document that, one of the documents that I'll be sending you actually helps uh, lay out this, what you're asking, Casey, in terms of um, where in the rule operators are given discretion to simplify a shape or SRA to remove along the long tails. Um, that is uh, documented in the, the one of the three documents I'll be sending you. Okay, that sounds good. Sorry, I was I was scanning it and I know that Seth and I had a lot of conversations about this and Dave Bechtel um, about these, these different shapes, uh, but I couldn't remember where in rule it gave that. Yeah, sorry, I, I zoned out for a second there, Rebecca. I I have the rule in front of me. Did you, oh, did you give yes, the, please share. It's, it's, it's 629-630-0910 sub four, and it says the landowner representative may adjust the distribution and location of slope retention areas, notwithstanding section three of this of this rule, if the selected slope retention areas clearly reduce worker safety um, and then the force uh, or cause more resource impacts such as additional road or landing construction, excessive side hill yarding or other yarding practices that clearly increase ecological impacts. And so there's an opportunity. So the guidance just sort of clarifies and the training clarifies this section. And, you know, it's not it's not necessarily big shifts. It's just it's just smoothing it to try to make it operationally, you know, those pixels don't, you don't want to put something on the ground in a pixel shape. It just doesn't, that's not the way the world works. So that, yeah, allows certainly, that sort of that's, shaping. that's helpful, Seth. Um, I think that uh, the, the way I was hearing it, at least from Rebecca was, Hey, we're going to, um, landowners can make these things, um, simpler to make things easier for them. Um, and that's not what I recognized and remembered from both the steep slopes training, or the certification and from, you know, our ongoing conversations about technical guidance and how to implement the stuff. So, and I think those are two different things that the language that you read versus how, at least I heard it from Rebecca. Uh, I do, I do apologize. And I think looking at this, I was kind of, you guys see the map here. Um, so again, smoothing those, those little tiny, uh, when I say simplification and ease, it's, it's, operationally you know they can smooth those out so that they're not doing these little tiny long stretches um you know they as long as they keep the area uh and the the number of trees from the original uh polygon then they are good but they also need to communicate this with the stewardship forester and it needs to be in their written plan and that for compliance monitoring it's something we will be uh you know verifying like did they keep the same area you know um and then also noting if they made it larger because there was something that the model didn't catch. So yeah, Amanda's got, welcome back, Amanda, but Amanda's got her hand raised too, Rebecca. Thank you, Um, because I can't see that. So Amanda, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's good to be back. It's good to see all of you guys. Excited to 
get back into um, into all of it. So I just wanted to um, a quick go back on kind of feeding off of uh, Francis's question and what Megan had highlighted just from the operator perspective, the, the contractor. Um, most of our contractors and the members that AOL has in the state are um, Oregon professional logger qualified. Um, and so they do get trained on force practice rules and um, environmental standards and you know employment and business law and you know requirements in the state and safety practices. So um, so many of our uh, many of the operators in the state that do perform that work are qualified under that um, uh, qualification that AOL manages um, with a sustainable forestry initiative. So just wanted to highlight that. Um, as far as an additional step there, that kind of uh, kind of quality assurance, if you will, um, many of our members are not going to be the engineers, you know, doing that layout, but the actual operators. There, there is a um, there is a standard there for folks that work on SFI certified properties. Um, so, just wanted to highlight that, and then to follow up with Casey's question here. Again, we get we can it can get a little bit confusing um, when we use the term term operator and rules and statute don't help us in that place. So, just being clear that the people that are uh, laying these slope retention areas out and doing that selection process, those are the landowners in in pretty much all cases. Um, those are not the contractors or the actual loggers, the operators. So, um, just to be really clear there. Thank you, Amanda. Are there any other questions? Okay. Um, so this, again, Camille Colette um, pulled this uh, table together for me. Um, and she created an excellent Excel table that we'll be sending you that will show you um, the steep, steep slope rules based on landowner and whether they look uh, took the standard RMA practice or the SFO minimum option. So in terms of stratification, there's a lot of rules that apply to, to some and not to others. And then again, to either just Western Oregon or statewide, which will help, um, let's see. And then I did mention the stream adjacent failures. That is a statewide. Um, that one we will be considering for future, not for the pilot. And uh, again, considering recommending it for the riparian rules rather than the steep slope rules, only because we they're not mapped and it's difficult to it would be difficult to query. Okay, so tasks for the committee, which I really appreciate you guys' input. Um, we sent you the road rules selection document. Uh, we will be sending you the following or in the after this meeting, we'll be sending you the following documents. One was called the steep slopes rule selection document, which has all the rules. And you can provide feedback on that document. Then for reference, we have the model steep slope assessment process considerations and then a reference table for the steep slopes. In that email, again, we'll send you the link to the uh, steep slopes certification training, which again, I highly recommend because it will help put all this in context. And then we are re uh, requesting that you provide feedback by November 7th um, and send it to the compliance monitoring at odf.oregon.gov email. And then next steps. So once we receive um, and combine feedback from the committee, we will send a document that has all that feedback um, to MHE, Mount Hood Environmental. They will then spend um, time reviewing that, that information and they will be presenting, I believe I, I heard Adam say at the end of January, so January, February, MHE will present their preliminary draft study design and protocol for roads and steep slopes. And I guess any additional questions? And I'm gonna exit out of the presentation. Thanks, Rebecca. And that'll be uh, January 30th. January 30th, okay, thank you. Yep, that's our next next meeting. Um, all right, well, I, Rebecca, I think you may need to make John uh, co-host so he can share his presentation. Okay, uh, and let me see, participants. Done.
Okay. I thank everyone for your patience. So John will be, um, well, thanks, thanks for the discussion uh, on the road rules and steep slope selection. Um, we'll hand it over to John. He's gonna present on the reforestation study. So John, whenever you're ready, um, if you wanna uh, share your, your, your PowerPoint and um, I'll hand it over to you. John, you're on mute. Okay, we'll try again now. Uh, are we are we showing a uh, background uh, thing on, on yes. the screen? Yes, I can see background slide. Okay. It cool. was very calming for a moment though, John. Uh, I just want you to know, it was like a nice moment of bliss. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's what people say when I'm, when I'm quiet, but... <laughs> Anyway, uh, so as far as what the statistician gave us, I want to give you some background on this first of all, that the, the forest practices rules specify that a stand must achieve free to grow standards by the end of the sixth full calendar year following completion of harvest. By that time, a stand of free to grow crop trees equivalent to the minimum stocking standards must be established. And the forest practices rules also spent, provide a means for converting between seedlings, saplings, and larger trees when performing this calculation. For example, if you have a 1 to 10 inch sapling, it counts as 1.67 seedlings. The stocking levels are reported in terms of seedling equivalents, or uh, pardon me, this is in my, all right, or seedling SEQs for short, and you'll see this reported on some of our graphs, the SEQ abbreviation. Stocking standards also vary according to the quality of the underlying soil. The standards will be 200 seedling equivalents per acre for class one to three soil and 125 seedling equivalents per acre for class four and five. And there are lower standards for poorer soils but we, uh, we did not encounter any of these on our surveys. The forest practices rules also provide a definition for trees that will meet free to grow standards. They must consist of trees of acceptable species of good form and with a high probability of remaining or becoming dominant over undesired competing vegetation. So acceptable species will include trees with economic value for timber and are generally within their native range. Good form and dominance are subject to field calls and we'll get a little bit later into discussion of how we remove some of the subjectivity or at least uh, standardize it. Critically, this forest practices rules definition also includes a distribution criterion. 80% of the operation area must contain the minimum stocking, and this is intended to avoid partial restocking or sizable gaps within the harvested unit. In terms of background, uh, we drew our sample according to the statistician's guidance to be random, and we drew it from ferns, from the e-notification system, which Rebecca referred to, and which is standard for our, for notifying with. And we do it a random draw from operations where notifier indicated clear cutter or overstory removal. Now, several types of harvest can fall under that umbrella. It's also notifiers can notify them for more than one type of activity on the same plot of land. And therefore, 
we need to, in order to avoid confusion, we need to look later and see, well, what did the operator actually do on that property? We also harvested or restricted our sample to harvested area between two and 120 acres. Logistically, it's very difficult to survey under two acres and the clear cut harvest exceeding 120 contiguous acres without a plan for alternate practice is contrary to the Forest Practices Act. Okay. Following the original randomization of the sample, we did do some pre-screening to try to establish population size and ensure that we didn't have duplicate notifications to remove those so that we did not have a probability that a given harvest unit had a greater chance to be chosen than others. And we also used pre-screening through imagery to identify notifications that were clearly unsuitable, meaning those that either the harvest did not take place or that the uh, harvest did not take place within our time frame. And we did this with the effort of trying to reduce the uh, number of unnecessary permission requests that would go out and so that we could reduce non-response on operations that were unsuitable in the first place. Nevertheless, there were numerous operations, especially on private non-industrial on some of these smaller operations where we could not clearly establish suitability. The imagery was ambiguous exactly what the landowner did. So we included these in our permission requests with the hope that landowners would respond and clarify regarding suitability. It's good to note that these landowner types were self-identified in ferns. The classifications in the ferns notification have changed a little bit since then, but at the time they were industrial, not industrial private, which we summarized as private industrial, or partnership slash corporate industrial, which we summarized as private industrial. So the landowner would pick the one that best fitted the or the notifier would, would pick the best uh, one that best fit the landowner's classification in the notifier's eyesight. So there is a possibility for ambiguity there. Uh, recent changes to ferns to include registered and classify based on registered to SFO designation should remove that amb ambiguity for future studies. And this draw was conducted from harvests ending in 2016 and 2017. And 2016 harvests were surveyed in 2023, 2017 harvests in 2024. And we did this so that we could clearly be at the within or have completed our FTG period prior to our survey so that uh, we weren't there getting there too early, basically. As far as our sample draw, we used a defined level of effort to obtain responses. We sent out permission requests to a spe specified overdraw, that's in the left-hand column with the arrow there, that was calculated to obtain 38 sites for each stratum. And then we followed this up with two phone calls. In the end, we obtained permission to survey 40 private industrial sites and 25 private non-industrial sites. Uh, the uh, one private industrial site was re removed subsequently by the statistician because of some ambiguity about the actual harvest thing and, uh, and whether it exceeded 120 acres. The, and the private industrials, non-industrials, you'll notice that uh, on the surveyed list to the right, that we actually only ended up surveying 25 of those. That still provided us a statistically valid sample, but even though it failed to meet our 38 site target because the statistician had provided us with, uh, with options for varying levels of uh, statistical confidence.
or for population coverage. We were still looking at 95% coverage. I want to note the columns here in the middle. Uh, we'll end up discussing concepts such as non-response later on, but but we did have a certain group of people who outright re refused. But our non-response column covers several types of landowners, those who we just couldn't reach. There are a number of these that we have reason to believe we have the wrong addresses for. Property changed over the ensuing six years, and the uh, land land lot layers, tax lot layers, were actually different from what we had for firms addresses. And we also had a number of people who, or uh, fourteen actually, private non-industrials who agreed to participate, but then never returned the paperwork. And for the statistician, that was equivalent to a non-response. So there was a variety of things contained within this non-response column. The field methodology went according to the protocol that we that the statistician laid out. And this methodology was designed to provide coverage of the unit while also providing statistical validity and to minimize bias. It was performed on the basis of a 150th acre plot, that's 16.7 feet radius, which I've represented on this, or is represented on this diagram with the small circles, the ones you have a pupil for the eye there, but that dotted line circle represents our plot. The black is the plot center. We perform this on a systematic grid with a random start point. And it was designed uh, as per statistician's request for a minimum of 27 plots, of which 18 were actually necessary for analysis. We needed a minimum of 18, but that provided us room to remove some plots if we had to. This green line and the circling through the middle of the diagram there represents a stream and plots that were in the RMA were removed because we didn't want to seriously bias our counts. So they were removed. We also offset some points such as those at the border. And we've shown that, that there was a systematic methodology to offset these points by moving set distances perpendicular to the harvest unit boundary or to a road if it happened to be because of a road. Now we had a request uh, from a committee member when we had our draft report to describe more on our methods to use to de determine free to grow. And we interpreted this to mean uh, how we did our field calls. As those who've done free to grow surveys know, there are some judgment calls required at times. And to standardize these calls, we borrowed materials used by state forest that they use for making similar type calls. And we adapted them to our use. And this diagram is actually borrowed from their document, but just, it does provide a good conceptual diagram. And so we provide this here. In this diagram, the conifers represent the crop species. The competing vegetation is pictured as de deciduous trees, but in reality, it can be many vegetation types. And at the lower elevations, this was frequently blackberry. At higher elevations, other species such as vine maple would provide competition. As shown in this diagram, if a crop tree of a good form is visibly taller than neighboring vegetation and clearly exposed to the light, like the tree to the left, it was a clear call of free to grow. The crop tree in the middle also is not very difficult. It is definitely being outcompeted by the neighboring vegetation and would not be considered free to grow. Now the tree to the right is receiving some competition and that's where the judgment calls come in and it would be made on other considerations like competition from other vegetation or slopes blocking access to the light. But what, so we did have to make these judgment calls. We did not try to be speculate with them, however. We did not try to speculate about eventual success, like if the tree in the middle were a western hemlock, we would not say, 
oh, that will eventually outcompete the other vegetation since it's uh, shade tolerant. Conversely, we didn't speculate if we had a high count and they both looked good at the time of our survey. We did not speculate that pre-commercial thinning would eventually occur on a tree, a tree and remove things on that basis. So we tried to avoid being over speculative, overly speculative. Once we had established our survey concepts, we trained survey personnel. Can I, can to, I interrupt, John? Yeah. To ask a question? Just because it might be helpful to do it in, right now rather than later while you're talking about this. Uh, who made these calls? Was it a forester that has that that has some experience in this arena, or was it? Uh, yeah, that's my, was it. Was it just data collected from the field, and then somebody in the office made the call based on the heights? Like, I'm just curious, who made the call? Well, the call was, was made in the grow. field. Uh, we have only one member who, uh, to my recollection, actually some of them have forestry degrees, so I shouldn't. Uh, I mean, have with various types of forestry. But uh, we had one member who's actually, uh, I think, had uh, extensive field forestry experience. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't 20 year veterans at making these calls. And that's one reason we tried to calibrate with others to <laughs> make sure that uh, we were consistent. Yeah, because as you know, this, this issue of free to grow is not a is not something that it, it's 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 where the the art of forestry comes in more in some ways more than the science, and it has to do as you kind of alluded to a little bit. There's some species certainly calls there, and there's also some, uh, you know, the, rarely do you run into a situation where trees are evenly spaced as this is right here, right? I mean, you, you you've got varying distances from the anyway. I won't belabor it, but yeah. Yeah, and uh, well, I can say that we recognized the problem, especially when we started training. We recognized the problem, and we tried to reduce the uh, difficulty. I, I can't have a clear view in my current view of participants, so I'll let uh, Adam, uh, should we address any of these other raised hands before I, I go on? Or uh... Yeah, I, would, I guess, um, yeah, part of this process, um, I know we had QA, QC, um, quality assurance control that we um, compared against, you know, different crews within our our monitoring group. Um, I know that there was some, there was definitely effort uh, prior to this. I know the staff went out with with uh, uh, Stephen at one point, um, but um, yeah, there was there was definitely an effort to to try to minimize any uh, inconsistency among data collection, and um, so I, I think Rebecca had her hand up to you. Rebecca. Is there anything to add there in terms of the free to grow calls? Yes, uh, that we had the trainings so that we could get everyone kind of with the same the kind of the mindset of what to look for. So we again calibrating, um, and we did have issues with the dog hair hemlock. You know, when, as, as you know, like, um, and trying to figure out, okay, <laughs> you got 50 trees in this, in this plot, um, and then identifying, you know, the, the best ones that, um, you know, the ones to count, because you can't count them all. So yeah, it was definitely a, a topic and um, the crew communicated with each other and, and tried to get feedback when they had difficult calls, they took pictures. So it was definitely um, a topic that we were addressing. And I think something that might be helpful, John, can you speak to, to based on these sort of uh, these calls, how often, you know, we saw uh, green versus red versus yellow there. Um, were there close calls like, you know, in every single plot or, or just as a, can you, can you speak to that at all? Um, well, we frequently had close calls. I, uh, I think we could say that probably, I, I wouldn't say every plot, but the, they were frequently, uh, frequent on, on units. Mm -hmm. Most frequent, as Rebecca says, that uh, these hemlock, uh, or, or you have volunteer hemlocks, but still ones we didn't try to speculate if they were of good form at the time we saw them. 
we didn't try to speculate which ones the landowner might try to take out. But uh, so we did actually have some some tough calls to make in that regard. Sure. Um, and uh, it varied by unit. Uh, so I, I think one of the big questions and what, what will be addressed later as well was their bias introduced. Uh, were we able to systematically get that? that and uh, as Rebecca mentioned, we have a, I was actually going to mention the QAQC program to check internal consistency. So, yeah. so we took, as I've already mentioned, we had efforts to make sure that the field calls were it out in our own little private universe somewhere, but were consistent with what people would do in the larger world. And then we did try to make sure we had internal consistency too. And the QAQC was there to check that. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I think the, the, the QAQC, we saw a pretty high percentage, which indicated um, a pretty good consistency among uh, data collection teams. Uh, so that uh, would suggest uh, um, unbiased uh, data collection. So um, mm -hmm. I think, uh, let's see if there's any, any other um, questions here. Uh, I think David had a comment there. Um, David, do you want to clarify your comment? Yeah, the the uh, bias control. Sure, language. sure. Um, I was I was uh, uh, talking about some of the specifics of the protocol that that we developed that um, were specifically intended to address. You know what is really you know a as uh, Seth alluded to as much an art as a science, but we are, we are charged with quantifying uh, and making measurable something that is, is inherently difficult. And so we tried to be explicit with our parameters and we tried to um, use randomization for what it is, it is uh, intended for, which is to control for biases that you can't eliminate. So by, varying the, the composition of our teams by performing QAQC, um, by uh, taking pictures and reviewing particularly difficult calls. We, you know, used statistical power uh, and randomization to account for bias that could not be eliminated. Thanks. Well said. Appreciate that input, David. Are we good for me to go on now, Adam? Or uh... yeah, please oh. continue. Thanks, John. When we get into once the field the field data were gathered, we delivered the data to the statistician. Now the statistician in analysis had chosen a method that addressed both average stalking and distribution of free to grow trees. Oftentimes and I did this in the planning survey, actually, stocking, overall stocking of a unit is calculated using the mean, but this only measures, it addresses the average stocking of the unit. It does not address the distribution of trees on the unit, and the statistician tried to come up with a method that would, uh, that would address the requirement that 80% uh, of our unit be covered uh, with trees. And for that reason, the statistician chose the tolerance interval. And this, uh, just a second here, there's conflict from the hot topics meeting showing up on my screen. Anyway, so the statistician chose a method for assessing compliance that addressed both the average docking of the unit and the distribution of trees on the unit. Since the forest practices rules specify that 80% of the unit must meet minimum stocking requirements, the statistician chose to use a tolerance interval approach. So this approach estimated the minimum stocking level for 80% of the unit with 95% statistical confidence. This type of approach will provide a conservative, conservative estimate of stocking and will produce a lower estimate of stocking than use of the mean alone. So this figure here, I've actually taken from one of the figures in the graph, adapted it a bit. 
but shows the graphic approach anyway that the statistician used to report these data. Analysis results were displayed for each harvest unit in the terms of unit mean, this gray dot here. The lower bound of the tolerance interval, the point where statistically 80% of the unit was, uh, but the statistician was confident that 80% of the unit met this level. And then, so that's the, that's the black triangle. And also in terms of the dotted line here, which is the minimum tree requirement for the minimum seedling equivalents per acre for that unit. And the statistician also displayed the error bar showing the potential uncertainty of the mean due to sampling, sampling errors, variability upon the landscape. The y-axis here does represent the uh, seedling equivalents per acre. For this unit, the uh, applicable stocking standard is 125 seedling equivalents per acre, shown here. We have 200 for some others. For this particular unit, all statistical indications would be that the unit is compliant with stocking requirements, really independent of method used. And we'll get to the diagram where that uh, that this comes from in a couple a couple of slides here. But first, I want to get to our results from the compliance rate. Overall compliance rates were reported in Table Five of the report. Because the stocking requirement varies by soil class, results are broken out by landowner type and stocking requirement. However, the three bottom line numbers are outlined in the red box. The overall private industrial compliance estimate was estimated at 92.3%. Private, private non-industrial compliance was estimated at 76%. And when weighted uh, towards the number of, towards for the population came out with an overall estimate of 89.4%. The right-hand column shows the tolerance interval for all all of these, sorry about that. I got kind of frisky with the mouse here. Anyway, the uh, it shows the overall tolerance interval. And this represents the uh, amount that 99% of the population was estimated to have. So this calculation covers 99% of the population. A calculation covering a smaller proportion of the population would provide tighter tolerance intervals. These are somewhat wide. The overall tolerance interval for the uh, statistician get found was 76 to 99% compliance. John, you got a hand up. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think it says Seth. Seth so. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Hey, I, I've had this er, on my first reading of, of, of this uh, report. I had this question and I've kind of been waiting for this opportunity to ask it. And I think we talked about this uh, during the, uh, you know, the lead up or, or maybe it was in one of the past iterations of the uh, maybe last year's report or whatever. But uh, I'm not completely solid on the on the answer. And so here's the question. As you report these compliance estimates. Uh, maybe I'll back up. As you go out to one of those uh, sites, right, and you're and you've got your plots uh, situated, and for simplistic sake, I'll say, uh, you know, you've got hundred plots out there. Um, if one of those plots doesn't meet um, doesn't meet uh, uh, standard, so is is sub, you know, less than two hundred trees per acre, does the entire unit then fail, uh, uh, or is that considered 99% compliant because only one failed? So in other words, are this the way you're talking about this compliance estimate, would this suggest that on private industrial, 
92.3% of the units are, 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 are meeting free to grow or 92.3% of individual units. You see what I'm saying? So I guess back up my original question, would that be 99% compliant or would that be non-compliant fail the whole thing? Oh, uh, we wouldn't fail the whole thing. Uh, what would happen there is a, this would actually factor into the distribution. Of course, the uh, the one plot that was under would probably it would have a pretty small impact on the overall means. So if you were good on on the other units, it's unlikely that you would fail. Uh, uh, At what point does it then tip the scale? Is it five plots? Is it ten plots? Like uh, so. Yeah. So the uh, from the statisticians and the, this is you know I have to be careful here because <laughs> there are there are nuances to the tolerance interval that I don't understand. But uh, if you had seventy nine percent of your pl uh, plots that were meeting and twenty one weren't, then my understanding is the tolerance interval would. Uh, draw a pretty conservative estimate of that. So uh, the estimated uh, amount would be somewhere under 200 trees or 125 trees per acre. And- uh, Okay. And if one, if, 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 if several plots were well over 200 trees per acre free to grow, you know, say you had 300, 350, and then you had, you know, another, another 25% were under, does that, oh, see, I just have some questions about whether we're, you know, how you're calculating some of the, is it, is it good? Is it not good? Is it not good based on a unit basis? So if, if some, if, if a big enough proportion of a unit didn't pass, then the whole unit fails, or are you looking at it more from the total plot number across this many units, how many percentage of those failed? I'm just not completely clear based on the, the write-up of how that was done. Okay, well, I I can think I can speak to some of that, that 92.3, uh, and I'll actually show us, you'll we'll see that on the next slide, but that 92.3% uh, figure was based on 39 private industrials, and three of them uh, had tolerance intervals that were below, well, as it, as it turns out, 200 trees per acre. And that was the statistical uh, calculation there. Okay. So when they hit, so then my second question is when they hit 200 trees per acre uh, or in a given plot, if they had enough trees, did it like stop or did it take into account extra trees? And then did that somehow get, did that jam get spread across the entire piece of bread? You know, see what I'm saying? Or, or did it not, did it not account for, I'm just, Either way, I just want to make sure I understand, I understand what I'm seeing when I'm seeing these numbers. My understanding of the way the tolerance interval works, you, you know, if you were dealing with a mean, yeah, that would all get smoothed out. Uh, my understanding is that, uh, that that wouldn't be smoothed out for the distribution component, okay. which is... Uh, okay. All right. That's helpful to understand. I, th I think I have a better footing. Yeah, I uh, actually had some similar questions when the statistician proposed the tolerance interval. I didn't know exactly how it would work. Uh, still, uh, uh, conceptually, I kind of know how it works, but <laughs> there, there are some difficult nuances there. This next graph actually shows the detail how things worked out unit by unit. And it's sorted from highest to lowest estimated stocking. As previously described, the y-axis shows the seedling equivalents per acre. And the dashed line represents the applicable stocking requirement. The gray dot represents the estimated mean stocking of the unit, and the gray error bar is the 95% confidence interval. And this black triangle that you see on these is the headline number that the, that the statistician used in calculation. And it, I think, comes uh, shows some of what uh, Seth's talking about here, or the difference that your methods 
would produce your choice of uh, analysis method. This graph was broken into three panes to permit comparison of units that have similar landowner type and stocking requirement. In the left-hand column, the private industrial units with a stocking requirement of 125 seedling equivalents per acre were all found to meet that standard. It's a sample of about eight, but, uh, but all of them were well in excess of 125 uh, seedling equivalents per acre. All right, uh, Adam has a question here, so maybe yeah, I'll just, go. just wanted to, to mention for um, determining compliance, um, there's there's a section in the report that um, just focuses on compliance determination. And, um, uh, you know, that's something that if if there's more details required, um, you know, I'd be happy to, to, to get more details from Mark um, to make it crystal clear on how that that compliance was was determined. So um, just wanted to offer that um, up if it's not clear in the report or uh, and we'll go back and, and take a look at that. But um, the one thing, the overall compliance rates, John, are, are, are at the unit level. It's my understanding. Um, those, yeah. Those higher level summaries are based on uh, percentage of units that were in compliance, correct? That's correct, yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Sorry for interrupting. Just wanted to offer that up. No, that's good. And, and I, uh, yeah, didn't know what to say about what we'd forward to the statistician. I, If we have questions that go to the statistician, uh, I hope someone else can capture them because I'm not able to really capture them while giving this presentation. Yeah, and John, I put um, into the chat just the the top line um, kind of summary sentence from the compliance determination section, which is page three um, of the the draft uh, report, um, and I just put it in the chat. And it makes it pretty clear to Adam's point that it's um, each unit is either in compliance or not as a binary, right? Rather than like the sum of all the the total trees per acre per plot summed together or something. And, but I think that your your the the charts you have right now also lay that out really nicely on the screen. Right, and these are given in the report. Uh, I forget the number now of of the figure, but but it's there. I'm just hoping to give a little bit of an interpretation to it. Uh, uh, most private industrial units that had a stocking requirement of 200 seedling equivalents to acre were also found to be well in excess of that standard, but we did have a few that were borderline down here. And in this case, only one of them would have outright, uh, if we'd used the mean as our indicator and not considered distribution, then we would have had a 90, well, only one of those units would have been below targets. These, uh, I, I can recall at least two out of three of these, and uh, these that had the borderline uh, conditions were suffering from certain environmental uh, challenges. That uh, uh, could affect question, our John. Yeah, uh, from Steve Fitzgerald. So yeah, I was just looking at that. The, you know, the one that one industrial that's below. Uh, as a practitioner, I wouldn't do anything about it because that that one because it's it's it may be insufficient by just a little bit. It will grow into adequate stocking in a very short period of time. Um, now, if you're way below, you know, like you see in some of the private non-industrial, that's a whole nother matter. But I just wanted to add that as a practical comment. Okay, I see Seth also has a raised hand here. Yeah, another another practical comment or question. I, and we talked about this at length when we were during the design phase of this. So I'm just not sure because I don't see it in here. If a unit, uh, so, so if one of these uh, plots fell on a rocky site, right? Because units are not monolithic. Some some areas within a, with uh, on the ground have, higher, you know, levels of difficulty in terms of reforestation than others. And so it's 
so when you had those situations, were those accounted for? How, and if so, how were plots thrown out if they were in, in rocky sort of soils or had some other, you know, uh, rock is obviously the, the main one, but there's there can be other, you know, extenuating circumstances that make it difficult in that spot. Really wet spot is another situation where you might have you know, it's not really wetland, but it's standing water chunks of chunks of the season. Um, was any of that accounted for in the plots? Uh, yes, I gave a couple examples of where we would throw plots out. I did not uh, mention, but yeah, if we were, if our plot was, I think it was over thirty five percent on on rock. I'm not, okay. and I'm not talking poor soil that you can grow trees on because I know there's varying qualities. So this is like a rock or something okay we you know if it was over 35 percent then we threw that that plot out we did not take a measurement and uh we counted on our minimum of 18 that's why we had some extras in the first place okay thank you sorry for making you have to go back and this is casey and um, i think sets um raised a good point and I, it, that's all, obviously also modeled in these confidence intervals because um the the um the dot in the middle both the tolerance interval lower bound and the mean um are the mean of all the plots within a stand or a unit um uh, just to be clear so it that unless there would be a, a situation where it's a steep rocky slope for the entire thing on a south facing slope where everything got fried um then it is taking into account a lot of different places within that harvest unit Oh, and I just want to um, add to I totally recognize that there's um, there's there could be a little bit of discomfort with the results. Um, but to to Stephen's point um, and to Seth's point, um, practical, I just want to clarify that practical forestry is different than the rules. Right. So like I'm reading the rules and the rules say, you know, above this and below this. Right. Um, and so I just want to clarify that's different when we're talking about the rules, different than different than practice. And those can be awkward, right? Because like, you know that that's going to grow in really quickly in many of these cases, but at the moment it's like, quote, out of compliance. And that's just really important for all of us to see, um, knowing, of course, that it's going to come back into compliance probably pretty quickly. Thanks for those uh, comments. Uh, they were quite useful. I I would note uh, that's where some of these uncertainty bars came in. We have to report whatever we got by the chosen metric, but uh, having a display of uncertainty is good. <laughs> Show, well, are we really out there or is there, <laughs> is there some room where it's saying, well, uh, things could vary just because we picked the wrong spots for our plots. Um, and so there could also, uh, you know, be micro inclusions of poor soils that just do not show up on NRCS uh, soil maps. We. We had to go with the with the material we had that said at this site, well, it's 200 trees per acre according to the NRCS uh, data. But we know there are little inclusions of poor soil and we couldn't dig a soil pit at every <laughs> location. Um, oh, getting back to... Uh, so the right-hand pane uh, is the private non-industrial, which one person referred to. And it shows quite a bit of variation. The units of the highest stocking were comparable with those of the highly stocked private industrial sites. But there is a subset of the private non-industrial stratum that clearly did not achieve stocking requirements. Compliance calls would have been the same, actually, if you look at the black triangles and the gray dots there. It would have been the same. We would have had the same compliance percentage, whether you use the mean alone or the tolerance interval as your metric. And having been out on some of those field studies, I happen to know that uh, heavy vegetation competition, especially blackberry and hazel, since we were often dealing with low elevation on the private and non-industrial. So heavy vegetation competition, high mortality and sparse planting were noted as causes for the low private non-industrial counts in, in those particular units.
as far as the QC results, and I think David Showalter uh, alluded to this earlier. I have it's not a little graph in this case, but uh, the the um, statistician found no evidence that measurement error bias compliance estimates or errors were distributed on both sides. Uh, and uh, in most cases for small, they increase some. You get out to some of the larger ones where in these dog hair uh, hemlock units that uh, Rebecca mentioned. But the overall upshot of it, so, so here you have the uh, highest histogram here of the difference between the calls, between the original call and the QC call. And the statistician made this histogram. And uh, so the, the modal column, the one that's the highest, shows zero disagreement, but each consecutive one gives plus one tree or minus one tree, and so on. As you go through this histogram, the bins are one tree apart. The statistician did not find that measurement error bias compliance estimates. Further, the statistician found that measurement error only accounted for 3% of total observed variance. So in addition to us not actually giving high estimates or low estimates with our counts, also found that uh, of the uh, variance on the, on the unit, that uh, most of the variance, like 97%, the of the variability within the unit was actually due to variability on the land itself and not because we introduced it. So this kind of uh, showed that our QC results were showing that we were helping in, in bringing ourselves close to the actual standardization of the free to grow. Uh, and uh, then we get to the uh, non-response, and we know that non-response has bedeviled us throughout the compliance monitoring process. As we previously mentioned, we pre-screen for site suitability to try to reduce that. And the statistician, and we'll see it on the next slide, actually performed an analysis to estimate uncertainty due to non-response and refusal of access on the land. So looking at those, after we had screened for the sites that we obviously were unsuitable, we um, put out request and permission requests, which came out for uh, included some sites that we couldn't say for sure. We could say, oh, they were probably unsuitable. Or in a few cases, there were cases where uh, we where we had, uh, you know, I was looking at Landsat imagery, trying to uh, trying to get a date on when the harvest was ended, and sometimes the landowner had a different uh, completion date. So there, in, through this process, we actually confirmed which harvests actually occurred during our time period. It excluded some because they didn't, and some where the landowner showed, well, actually, this did not occur. So we were able to remove the ones through, through that process that were confirmed as unsuitable. And then overall, we received permission. We had permission re refused on 30 sites total and non response. So we had about 87% of uh, PI sites. And I think that's after uh, unsuitable sites are accounted for. The raw numbers would be 65% of uh, PI sites that we received permission to survey for and 15% of uh, PNI sites of the total draw. And this is certainly low on the PNI site as what it was in 2013 to 17. I think that I saw that uh, Josh Seeds had his hand up. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, so I thought I thought I re recalled that um, access was required by the private forest accord rule changes, and so I, I decided I better check to make sure my memory was accurate. 
Uh, and yeah, under administration for compliance monitoring, there's, um, you know, section seven, forest landowners shall accommodate the state forester by allowing access to the operation site for activities that they have informed the state forester of completion. Um, so I, I guess the question is why did we ha uh, go ahead and exclude sites where permission was refused? Um, the statisticians at the Mount Hood environmental folks in their report rightly called out that um, compliance, especially for, for PNI, was probably um, biased high um, because, you know, you would expect that refusal of permission might be due to compliance issues. Um, in addition to just, you know, Western United States folks, we're, we're prickly about property, people on our property um, as, as a general principle. Um, so why why was it, um, you know, not pursued that shall accommodate the state forester, um, give, given the way that would introduce bias, um, uh, you know, towards estimating compliance higher than it probably is? Thank you for your comment, uh, Josh. I was insufficiently clear. I, I, I mentioned that, uh, that the units that we looked at were harvested in 2016 or in 2017, but I did not make clear that they would therefore have been under the old rules prior to the time that uh, we had these rule changes that granted us access. And yeah. so- John, if I can add, um... To, to your yeah thanks for for bringing that up the um and the, the new rules went into effect um this year january 1st i believe um so that was um we uh started the study uh reached out to landowners uh prior to that so um the those rules that you're referring to weren't into a into effect um whenever we uh reached out to landowners. So uh, we're still kind of operating uh, before the, the new rules when uh, for this study, but moving forward, we will um, have access to uh, private land. So because the new rules came into effect January 1 this year, it will, um, that kind of shall allow access kicks in for units that were notified starting this year. Is that correct? Um, Yes. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. So we'll see this, we'll see this uh, non-response bias um, for some time longer as we kind of work our way through the system. Um, and, and so it'll, it'll be several years down the road before we're really looking at non-response or refusing permission being an option. Well, so my understanding is that we will uh, at the when we start with the um, riparian rules and the road rules and steep slopes um, that we will have access to um, for reforestation. Um, you know, I don't I don't know that we're necessarily going to be doing reforestation moving forward unless it's directed by the board since it's not a priority rule, but um, as Casey pointed out, thanks Casey, uh, for this particular rule, yes. that. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, Josh. It does, thank you both. Yeah, thanks Adam for the added color there. And so we actually had, do have two different columns to represent those landowners who did not give us permission. They include those who directly refused permission and those who did not respond. Motivations for these landowners vary, so there was no firm basis for making assumptions about the compliance characteristics of these landowners. As previously mentioned, we had 14 landowners who agreed to participate but never returned the permission forms. And these were included uh, on the statistician's advice as non-responses. Now to address the uh, part B, or uh, maybe the one question that wasn't directly asked by Josh, of course, we know that non-response has a potentially large effect on co compliance de determinations. 
And so our statistician did a sensitivity analysis to try to address this concern. And here's a graph of the result of that stat of the sensitivity analysis. On this graph, our observed compliance is shown by the red dots. A statistician, and you'll see that in text, uh, how these numbers are derived, but the statistician observed that the number of PI operations is much greater than that of the private non-industrial. Uh, the statistician, and these are ones that actually took place uh, in the population as a whole, that uh, estimated about 82% uh, of the operations were, uh, of the units were private non of uh, pri excuse me, private industrial. So the private industrial would receive greater weight in the analysis. The statistician made no assumptions about the characteristics of non-respondents, whether compliance would be lower, higher, or similar to our observed rates. I want to draw to the attention to the bottom of those three, which includes both non-response and access refuse compliance. The other two graphs had shown those separated out but this is the cumulative effect of the two. And I've high actually, uh, because it's not a very prominent line, I've actually highlighted the line that represents both private industrial and private non-industrial taken together. So the x-axis on these panels represent the rate of compliance for the scenario being considered. The y-axis uh, axes on these panels, or y-axis on this one panel in this case, represent total compliance for each rate. So in other words, you have this line here that's drawn from, hey, if you ass assume zero, that none of the people who did not uh, grant us permission, that the, none of them complied, if you assume that, you'd be at the lower end here. If you assume that all of them complied, you'd be at the upper end at the right-hand end. So it's a sliding scale, but we do not know really which, where within that scale we lie. And this graph shows the potential effects. So if, and I just, uh, for ease of simplicity, I picked a 50% compliance rate just to show the potential effect. If you had a 50% compliance rate, it would actually draw us down some, but not as much as you might consider. It would actually draw down the private non-industrial pretty considerably. And down to about 63%. Private industrial would drop to about 85 from about the 92 that was uh, calculated. Or the from the, let me see, yeah, it was 92% that was calculated uh, as we actually stood. So it dropped from that red dot to the blue dot. But overall compliance would actually be much closer to the private industrial than to the private non-industrial. That would, that assumption would drop us to about 80%. And that's because, because we're weighted heavily towards the large number of private units, at, uh, private industrial that are being harvested. I do, uh, again, want to emphasize that we don't know the actual compliance rate of the non-response non and excess refuse compliance uh, classes. I chose this particular example because it's easy to demonstrate graphically. More appropriate assumptions for compliance rates could be formed by use of other data, such as stewardship forester inspections. So this does attempt at least to put some sideboards on the potential effect of non-response on our numbers. And with that, do we have further questions or were they all asked <laughs> over the course of the meeting? Yeah, John, this is Casey. Um, thanks for getting um, us through it and for taking questions along the way. I was worried that I would forget if I didn't ask in the middle, um, but I appreciate it. I'm going to try to 
get out of the slideshow. I may have to resort to it if someone has a question, but uh, this way I can see people again and <laughs> get more of a feel. What's going on? You just push stop share and it should go back. Oh, oh okay. Let me see where is that. Um... Should be at the top. You see, I, I might be able to do it. Let's see. Well, while while they're uh, closing out the PowerPoint, um, I just wanted to add that sensitivity analysis um, uh, performed by MHE was um, a way, I guess, this uh, scenario um, to evaluate sort of that that range of compliance accounting for non-response, and so that was. Um, in response to some of the concern around um, that we've heard and feedback around non-response to to paint a clear picture of what that potential range could be. And it doesn't necessarily reflect, um, it's, it's not showing points of data collected. It's, it's more of a um, scenario analysis. So um, just wanted to add, add that piece. Um, Seth, yeah. yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. And I do think that's helpful, that analysis. So it's appreciated. Um, I got a question around, you know, it's kind of dovetailing off Josh, Josh Seed's uh, question and, and, and issue there uh, with with regards to being able to, you know, now the rules allow that access, uh, clearly allow that access for compliance monitoring purposes. Has the department um thought about how you're going to go about um wielding that uh that authority at this point like this pro for this program uh i would imagine there's still going to be outreach you don't want to just show up on somebody's property with survey tools especially small forest landowners in southern oregon or other places that are that are particularly prickly as josh said um and and so I'm wondering, uh, is that is that a thing that this group would provide feedback on, whether it be the process or the letters or what have you? I'm just curious how the department is thinking about moving forward there, because clearly, you know, while it's nice to have that in rule and in statute, it's uh, it's another thing entirely in practice to just barge onto people's property and start taking measurements. So. Um, curious what the thoughts of the department is. Yeah, that's a um, great question. So we've started to sketch out a more detailed process. Um, currently in rule, it's, it's um, you know, the paraphrase, it provides access, right? There's, there's a subsection around access, uh, private land, and then the next you know, subsection is around obtaining a warrant. And so there's there's not a clear process lined out in rule. So um, right now we um, have sketched out, started to sketch out a step-by-step -step process, including outreach um, and sort of the steps uh, that the department would take to obtain access. Um, I think it would be helpful, Seth, for this committee to review that um, because, uh, in getting feedback, um, I, I don't know what, what specific meeting will, will do that, but, um, I, I, you know, it's just in terms of transparency and getting, catching things that we might miss. Um, I, I think that's, that's a great idea for the committee to provide feedback on that. So, uh, we're still working through that, what that protocol will look like, but, um, hopefully have that, um, you know, detailed out uh, by the end of this year. Um, Adam, this is Josh uh, Seeds at DEQ. So um, I, I think that's a good idea to bring that to the committee. Um, and one of the reasons you've got, so, uh, you know, there's a number of ODF folks on this call, also myself and Rod Kramer, we're all public employees. And so there has this is, you know, made the news and there's even stuff coming out of the governor's office about um, threats to government employees. And that can include and has included natural resource agency employees. 
-hmm. So I think as we're going through that, um, we do want to have an eye towards not just, you know, ensuring compliance with access, but safety um, for ODF and its contractors. Um, and and there's so put some thought into the protocols to deal with that if you encounter hostility threats or intimidation um, right. because yeah you, you we get access to the state police but if we can head off that issue in the first place i think that's that's better so that that would be something i think to consider is working on on that piece of it yeah, I appreciate that, Josh. And uh, yeah, safety's uh, number one concern for sure. I don't want to send teams out there if, if there's um, any risk um, to, to them. So uh, yeah, I appreciate the, the feedback there. Yeah, uh, Adam, uh, this is Steve. I just, I would just uh, echo those comments. Um, and I would uh, encourage you guys that to use all possible means to avoid going the administrative warrant uh, route. Um, I've, we've had, some, I've had some experience with this stuff and, uh, and, and my experience goes back a number of years. You guys are in a, uh, even a dicier um, environment right now. Be very careful about how you approach this and uh, be as collaborative and, outreaches to the degree you can because it's going to be very important to get that cooperation thanks steve yeah, and, and um the other i you know for the reforestation study i know that we worked uh we reached out to stewardship foresters um in uh areas all, all areas um and particularly you know we sent them kind of the, the list of landowners that we were planning on reaching out to you and um, we'll use a similar process, at least incorporate that into it. So, cause they have the local knowledge, they know the landowners, they know um, if, if there's anyone that, that may know where the risks are, um, they would. So um, yeah, that's, that's a, um, we do have resources internally that, that can help kind of buffer that a, a bit, but I do appreciate the concern. It's, it's definitely a concern of mine too. So thanks. You might, you might also, and maybe you've already done this, but, uh, you know, your sister agency in Washington, the DNR, I have a history there. And I think from, although my memory is getting fuzzier and fuzzier as the years go by, I believe uh, the DNR has that access in statute and has for years um, and has been dealing with this very issue that you're talking about. Although I totally agree with Steve, the the climate around uh, politics in the world today is different than it was 15 years ago, and it's particularly even more sensitive. And so I would uh, recommend perhaps checking in with those guys and asking them how they do it, what's their, and I'm not saying that they're that they're perfect either. They probably would admit, readily admit that, but there might be some stuff you could borrow from there that they've already, they've already had experience with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, um, had some conversations with DNR about their program. Uh, we didn't get into that yet, but um, that does remind me in a um, bit of a, um, a tangent here. Um, one thing that I've, I'm starting um, to initiate is reaching out to other compliance monitoring programs in other states, including DNR, Washington DNR, uh, CAL FIRE, uh, Idaho, um, Alaska. And um, I think we're I'm starting to organize a compliance monitoring symposium uh, for next to, for fall of 2025. Um, and, and I think that seems like a good good topic of discussion uh, to, to understand how they're they're handling that. Um, and each program is different, right? Um, you know, some are, have more resources and less resources, more regulation, less regulation. So I think there's there's a lot of topics like that that, that will be good to um, discuss and and just to, to, to hear what they're they're doing. And Adam, can you remind me, um, I was looking through the rules, but I have some understanding that it's um, that the the access requirement in general is uh just for non-smalls 
But looking at the compliance uh, monitoring section of the new rules, it looks like it's across the board for compliance purposes is that access is um, required for operations that have been notified and completed. Yeah, it's just um, like the little like pieces. Right. What I'm seeing in six, seven, eight, uh, division six, seven, eight, it's, it's just uh, it's forest landowners shall accommodate. Yeah. So Adam, as we're kind of transitioning and getting away from, and I know we're getting close to the hour here, I appreciate the report on the on the reforestation uh, aspect of this. And I know um, uh, you were now heading towards, you know, monitoring other things. And this was kind of the last year, so to speak, for for, for the foreseeable future of reforestation. I guess I would I would put in the back of your head or see what the rest of the committee thinks about this, but it seems to me like this was uh, could be a useful data point uh, in, in in coming back to. I don't know whether that's you know five, ten years down the road, whatever, and doing another similar, you know, with the same methods, go out and, and measure reforestation again and see do we see any sorts of trends um, and and you know have a little bit of a comparison back, even though it's not the PFA rules specifically, I still think there's some value potentially in doing that uh, down the road. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, any uh, thoughts from the committee on that? Appreciate that that suggestion, Seth. Particularly, my mind goes to some of the stuff we've, we've experienced in the last couple of years, you know, with, with uh, uh, and it's been somewhat documented with like the Fermageddon and of course the, the, in Southern Oregon and, and uh, the, uh, the, the, what do they call it now? The, the extreme heat, the heat dome, the heat dome right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've, we've had some reforestation challenges in the last, uh, in the last couple of years that I'm sure had some impact on the results that we're seeing here. And so it'd be, you know, in light of, uh, you know, changing climates and different things going on, it would just, it, I think it would be an interesting data point to come back to uh, in, in a few years and compare. Yeah. yeah and, and, you know, we have, we have the, the three priorities, you're aware the three priorities in terms of compliance monitoring, but, you know, um, the board um, can, can direct us on, you know, other studies as well. And, and so I think just understanding that how that process uh, works would be, um, advantageous for us so yeah. and i failed to mention the 2020 wildfires right i mean and the availability of seedlings i'm sure that had a huge impact on on what you're seeing uh and what what we've documented here yep for sure anyway. well um getting close to 11 any other uh questions comments feedback I would just note to you uh, keep a lookout for an email from Adam with those attachments for the steep slope rules and feel free to reach out if you have any questions about any of those documents. All right. Thanks, Rebecca. Well, um, thanks again, everyone, for, for engaging in discussion and, and the questions. Um, feel free to, to reach out at any point um, if you've got more, um, but I think we can wrap up there. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, all.